Okay, so hello everybody and uh, welcome. My name is Daniel Horowitz. I'm the expert genealogist of my heritage, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you not only uh, to a live audience here at the My Heritage headquarters, but also to all of you around the globe that uh, decided to come and attend and look and hear at this uh, webinar series that we're having today. Uh, we're going to start with our first presentation with my very good friend Thomas McKenzie. We have him here as a special guest in Israel for the Eurovision contest. Uh, I hope uh, you are all following what's happening in Europe uh, with this uh, contest from here from Tel Aviv from Israel and I hope that Thomas you are also enjoying uh, the parties and the festivities that we're having here. Uh, Thomas is a genealogy professional based in the U.S. He is a blogger, educator, author, social media connector, online community builder, and much more. His uh, goal in life after 25 uh, years of career in information technology, he decided to start sharing all his knowledge with everybody and try to teach also all what he knows to the people, the newbies and the oldies coming into genealogy. Yeah, most of us uh, are oldies in this uh, field. He managed a few websites, the High Definition Genealogy and Genealogy Bargains, just to mention two of them. And again, as I said, his goal in life is to teach, inspire, instigate, and serve as a curator and go-to guy for concept uh, of nurturing and inspiration. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the microphone to Thomas and I'm going to start his presentation as well. Thank you, Daniel. Hello, everyone. How are you? My name is Thomas McKenzie. I'm from Chicago, where many are cold, but few are frozen. And uh, we did have snow five centimeters two weeks ago on Saturday. Yes, yes, you did. Yes, yes, it was quite incredible. So it's great to be here in Israel. For those of you who are online, you know me, and I, I've done uh, uh, webinars many, many times. So we're going to get started. Uh, I ask that you do hold the questions till the end. Usually my teaching style is more where I like the interactive, but it doesn't work well for the webinar audience. So we'll wait till the end. Uh, also, so why did I call this talk the Genealogy Pit Stop? Does anyone here follow car racing? I'm not a car racing fan. I mean, I'll watch it on TV. Uh, we had the Watkins Glen racetrack in upstate New York, not far from where I grew up in the Catskills. And uh, I remember going to races there. But have you ever wondered how they go into a pit stop? Have you ever really looked at how they get out in 15 or 20 seconds? Uh, so that's why the focus of this talk is built around that concept. What is it going to take for you to just sit down and say, I have 15 minutes before the grandkids come home or before my TV show comes on, and I'm going to sit here and going to uh, do something with research. Is it really possible? How many of you put off research because you feel you just don't have a long second of time? Yeah, it happens. You know, you think that you have to dedicate a Saturday or a Sunday or, or something and sit down and do it, and I'm here to say that that is not always true. There's enough that you can do in these small increments. So. This is why the pit stop works. It works for me. I've been doing genealogy for 42 years now, since 1977. I was 14 years old uh, and watching the television series Roots on television in 1977 at my great grandparents' home. They helped raise me. Uh, and so these are the tools that I've developed over 42 years. So the first thing is you really do have to be focused. Now, we know that there's another product out there that starts with an A, and they keep pushing this shaky leaf concept, okay? That is not always very focused, because what do you do? You get on at 10 o'clock at night, and you go from shaky leaf to shaky leaf, and it's 2 in the morning, and what do you have to show for your research? You're just bouncing from thing to thing. So you have to develop a sense of focus. There are various ways to do that. Now, I have a certificate in genealogical research from Boston University. Did you know they have an online program? 15 week program. Yes, it's incredible. I thought I was a good genealogist until I took that. And it was 30 hours of homework a week. It's a degree, master degree level course. Uh, and that they gave me the tools and skills to develop this sense of focus. And I'll show you some of those tools. 
also, you have to ignore the BSOs. Do you know what a BSO is? Bright and shiny objects. Or as a dog would say, swirl, swirl, swirl. You know, the, you know their attention is always being diverted. So this is a problem. This is a challenge for me, even for me. I will get an email from a cousin and it'll say, hey, I found a new ancestor. Here's the photo. So what do I do? Do I stop everything I'm doing and go and research that new cousin? No. Thomas goes and says, I'm going to put it on my to-do list. I'm not going to go and go on a what we call a wild goose chase and down that rabbit hole because then you've lost focus on your original research plan. Here's an example. I put in a few uh, fun ones. So my cousin Hyacinth sent me an email with a shocking discovery. She found a new ancestor named Bertha Baranda. Okay. And then she sent me Bertha's photo. Uh, Bertha means business. You can see with that bow on her hat, she means business, right? And the thing is, then you're looking further and you say, oh, she's wearing this number. That must be the latest fashion in 1908. No, it's not. What do we know it is? Uh, she's not a suffragette. No, actually, she was a little bit more advanced than that. She was arrested and sent to prison for mayhem for five years. You want to know what mayhem was? She was the original Lorena Bobbitt. She actually sliced off her husband's nether regions. Yes. Now, and so they found her running away in men's clothes on a bicycle and arrested her. And so can you see how I would go and look up this new story and I would just chase this all night long? So that, that's the type of BSO that I'm talking about. Here's another one. This one I just threw in. Your other cousin, Daisy, she sent you an email with a shocking discovery. She found a new ancestor named Peter Freuken. And here's a photo of Peter, all six foot seven of him, wearing the polar bear coat. He killed the polar bear himself up in the Arctic. And that is his small wife, Dagmar, the Danish uh, uh, margarine heiress, who is also a Vogue editor. And what you go is you say, okay, that's nice, but I'm going to do a little bit more exploring. Don't do it, because this is what happens. Let me see if I can get this to work here. So, come on. There we go. This is what you find out. Arctic explorer Peter Freuken formed a chisel out of his own feces to free himself from an avalanche. He then amputated his own toes with a hammer without anesthesia. Yeah. How many times do you want to know that Dagmar heard that story every time she asked him to take out the trash? I bet, right? So these are the things that get us diverted. They're all fun. You know, they're all great. But the thing is, we've got to remain on our focus. So I threw those in. I use them in, in another uh, lecture. Now, the one thing that I do is for every person I am researching, I have a genealogy research goal document or known as a to-do list. Now, this is for my great-grandfather, the one who helped raise me, John Ralph Austin. Uh, and what I do is I maintain it in Microsoft Word. I want you to know that whatever system you come up with, if it's on paper, it's fine. It can be on Post-it notes, not that organized. I use Microsoft Word. Personally, uh, many of the programs have a way for you to track your work as well. You need to come up with a system that works for you. But do you see how this works? I completed these two tasks. I, I wanted to prove the birth date and location of my great grandfather. I crossed them out. And what's the advantage? When I pick up his work again, it could be tomorrow. It could be three weeks from now. I know where I left off. How often have you sat down and said, what did I do last week? What did I do yesterday? <laughs> what did I do an hour ago? This is the way that it works for me, okay? So I create a Microsoft Word document for every person in my tree. Uh, just, you know, I come from a large Irish family with 41 first cousins on my mother's side. So I've got to-do lists for all of the ancestors above them as well. Then there are some helper tools. What do I mean by helper tools? Uh, so what I mean by helper tools are, what are the tools that you use to help you do research outside of a program like MyHeritage? Uh, so what about bookmarks and favorites? Do you have those organized or do you do this? I remember that site I was on last month. Let me go on to Google and look for it. And guess what? 30 minutes is gone. 30 minutes you could have spent on an ancestor. And here you are looking for that phantom site. So what I want to recommend is this. Please work, please work, please work. 
Oh, no. There we go. Uh, I have created, and you can create a genealogy research toolbox. This is my version online. Uh, you can also, just so you know, it doesn't bother me if you take photos of my slides. I don't care. Yeah, please. Or you can take a photo. Uh, it's also in the handout. But this is what I've developed. I have my own genealogy research toolbox for all the links that I use on a common research. So like this, if I wanted to say general research, I'm going to click it right here. Come on. Let me do this. There we go. And what it is, is it has all my links down here uh, for all these different sites. Google Newspapers, Google Scholar. I need to update this. There's no longer Macabo. Uh, National Archives. Yes, there's even something called the Roots Web Search Thingy. That's what they call it. It searches all 11, doc, 11 million documents on Roots Web. Uh, so the thing is, do you notice how I've taken the time to set this up? So I always have this toolbox and I know, oh, I need something from NARA. I'm just going to go to my toolbox. Or I need an obscure site like US Gen Web or Gen Web Archives. I'm not going to spend time because the minute you go to Google, or Bing or Yahoo, there are distractions that are going to pop up. Now, your research toolbox can take many different formats. It can be, uh, let me see if I can get uh, over here. Control. No, I'm okay. I'm all right. There it is. It's hard when you're using someone else's laptop. Uh, I have this in various formats. There's nothing wrong with having this in an Excel spreadsheet in having it as a Word document. Again, it's got to be a system that works for you, all right? I happen to have mine available online because other people like to steal my resources. I don't mind that people steal my resources. Uh, share it, right? Okay, that's what it's called, yeah. And so even I have things like this, calculators and tools. Have you ever had to uh, calculate a birth date based on someone's death date on a tombstone? So those are the things that I'll go through. This is a, this is a great one for U.S., researchers. It's from the Newberry Library. There we go. Is it? Okay. It's from the Newberry Library. It shows how the states were formed and how the counties within the states were formed. And it gives you the historical boundaries for all these states. So this is a, a tool that I go to often because I want to make sure am I researching in the right county for my ancestor? Was it the original county or was it something that split off? So again, that's what I'm going to ask you to do. You might want to think about setting up some form of a research toolbox. Daniel, can I get some water, please? Thank you. Okay. So I also want to urge you that solid research tools win the race. Put a lot of time and thinking into building a set of tools. If you look at it, when the cars are there for the pit stop, they have everything they need. They don't have to go over to the tire store and get a tire. It's all there that they have. So, uh, again, we just did the genealogy research toolbox. So the other thing is your bookmarks and favorites. Organize them. Now, I'm not using my own laptop. Who here uses Google Chrome as a browser? Is that popular as a browser? Yeah. I've been using it since 2008 when it came out. They have a, thank you so much, they have a bookmarks feature where if you set up the bookmarks while you're logged into Google Chrome, they will follow you wherever you log into Google Chrome, like at a library or an archive. So that's what I've done as well. And when I save a bookmark or a favorite, guess what? Thomas takes the time to name it appropriately, so it just doesn't say internet site number one, internet site number two. I worked in a law firm for many, many years, and the attorneys always said, we want less clicks. We want to know what it is before we click on it. So take the time and label it appropriately. Uh, also, if you have books and articles that you use a lot that are in PDF format, they can go in this tool set as well. Uh, my ancestors are mostly New York Dutch, uh, 1641 in Schenectady, New York, and French Huguenot, 1675 in New Paltz, New York. So I have all of these PDFs on the church records from new cults and everything because I go and I reference them all the time. Why not have them handy? Uh, and then there are these other ones that I'm talking about, relationship calculators, uh, the historical value of money tool. How much was 
for me, how much was one U.S. dollar in 1910 when my great-grandmother mentioned it in a letter? I need to understand what would the value be today. So these are the types of sites. Let me make sure I'm okay time-wise. Good. Let me uh, take a, a breather here and show you another site. This one is probably not in the handout. Does anyone know about Wolfram Alpha? Anyone here? Yes. Yeah, what do you use it for? Do you use it at all? Somewhat. Okay. Wolfram Alpha is not a search engine. Come on, do you imagine? Okay. Uh, it's named after Michael Wolfram, who's a mathematician out of Indiana. And, yes. There, there is a handout. There's handouts. There are handouts. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, but if you want to take a photo, you can take a photo as well. So this is a computational database. I would use this as a resource. Uh, so things like what you can do is you can say, uh, who is my grandmother's niece? Oops, I know. And basically, it will calculate the relationship for you based on that information. Uh, and there it is. Not only will it do that, so it'll say it's your first cousin once removed. It will also come down here and show you the blood fraction, the blood relationship. So this is a calculation tool. You can put in things. This is another one that I like to often put in. Uh, if I'm looking for a nickname or another version of a surname, uh, I mean a given name. So if I'm looking for the word Elizabeth, and I should, I'm going to uh, increase this. Let's do this. There we go. Uh, so, I'm trying to zoom in here. Where's the zoom on this? Okay, there it is. Right here? Oh, okay. Great. Thanks. That's better, right? It's a little bit too much. No, 400% I don't want. There we go. Let's come down here. Okay. Perfect. And there we go. And so it will say it's a given name. You have to understand that Wolfram Alpha is very U.S. heavy. I mean, it calculates U.S. currency, and, and they're, they're looking to expand. But it will tell me how popular the name was in the U.S. over time. Uh, right now, there are 1.2 million people in the U.S. with that name. But this is the advantage. Look at this. Alternate versions. 23 different versions for Elizabeth that you may not have known. So it will actually go ahead and do that. So we've got Libby, Ibby, some of these I would not even have known. So take a look, it's called, uh, called Wolfram Alpha, but again, these are the type of tools you say, you know, I wish I remembered I had used this tool I wanted in my toolbox. Uh, here's another one. How do you name your files? Is there a question in the back? Oh, Hebrew dates. Okay, that's good for translating them. That's very good. Yeah, that's good. I do a lot of Greek genealogy, so with the Orthodox calendar, it's off by 10 days. And so I've had to use it that way as well. Yeah. So how do you name your files? Let's say you save an image from MyHeritage, or you have a certificate, or some document. Uh, do you actually just call it whatever and throw it in there? That's what a lot of people do. Look at my naming convention here. So on the first one, this is for my great-grandfather's U.S. World War I draft registration card from June 5th, 1917. Uh, luckily, we live in a time where we're no longer limited to eight characters on a file name. Remember those days? I was the master of the underscore. I used underscore a lot for spacing. Uh, now I think the limit is 255 characters for a Windows 10. It's not a little bit more. What is it? Yeah. Oh, way more. Okay, wow. I, I thought it was 255. So look at this one. I do my given names in all caps because Austin is a common first name in my family. Then I say John Ralph. And this little one right there where it says B1896, what does that mean? Yes. Why? Because I have more than one John Ralph Austin in my tree. This is an easy way to make sure that I'm on the right John Smith or John Jones or whatever to do that. And then it gives the name of the document, 
And at the end, these are the way that I save my dates. I do the year, the month, and the, the year, the month, and the date. That's the way I do it. Now you can do a variation. I had some people that will put that number first because they like to have their files sorted by, uh, you know, uh, order in terms of date to do it that way. The second one, let's look at the second one. It's similar. Austin, John Ralph, B1896, 1920, U.S. Census Population Schedule, and the census day was April 1st, 1940. Okay, so there's any variation you can come up with. Again, a system that's got to work for you. Someone had said, well, what do you do for married women? What name do you use? I always use the birth name. So for my great grandmother, it would be McGinnis, Therese. And then what I might do sometimes is I would put in parentheses M, Austin, John Ralph. She married John Ralph Austin, in parentheses. I have one ancestor, ancestress, who's a black widow. She uh, married all three of the Austin boys. I think she killed off the first two. So the thing is, what I did, though, is I listed all her marriages as part of her name. So I always know when I look at her, oh, yeah, she's the one that married these people. But you, but in a way, you've got to come up with whatever works for you, okay? Very often when we save documents from, from MyHeritage or other sites, they will assign it just a number, and that number is not going to make sense to you. The goal is, why should I waste time clicking on documents when I want to use that time searching for ancestors? That's what it comes down to. Uh, a to-do list. I really urge you to consider the to-do list similar to what we've done before. Uh, and also, for using the family search wiki. Anyone familiar with the wiki? We hope you are. I hope you are. Uh, this is run out of the Family Search site. It's set up similar to Wikipedia. You can actually create your own article. So you can create a login. You can add information. Uh, let me come out here to it. I'll let you take your photos. Uh, you just have to search for Family Search Wiki. It's also in the handout. And let me get it blown up 200. There it is. So you can come up here and search for any type of topic, any location. And they have over, they have almost 90,000 articles right now. If you are not familiar with the record set, don't fumble around trying to figure it out on your own. This is the best way to understand the history of a record set. If you're not familiar with the U.S. Census, uh, I would come in here and I'd say 1940 Census, uh, things like that. So this is the typical site. So anyone want, anyone, uh, any suggestions as to how you use it? Anyone here want to tell me how they're using it as well? So, yeah. So it's, it's one of those sites. It's just like Wikipedia. It's more genealogy focused. So that's something that you can do. See here. And my research log. Uh, there's, a, there's a link uh, in the handout. I give out this document for free. It's also at genealogyresearchlog.com. It has its own domain. This is the way I track my work. Nothing goes into my heritage database on my tree until I put it through this system of proof. Let me ask you, if you find one document to prove the birth of your great-grandfather, is that it? Are you done? No. Genealogists have learned that they need to do a reasonably exhaustive search. You need to look as many documents as possible. So I need to go out to the uh, hard drive for this. So let me see if I can find that. I might need my trusty assistant here. I think I've got it, Daniel. Yeah, I think so. Let's see. Oh. Let me see what that would be. Oh, this PC. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it helps if you put it in, you know? Jeez. Wow. We're not there on wireless yet, so. Exactly. Exactly. And it's dry V, actually. So thank you. Uh, let me show you. Uh, this is typically how I do my work uh, with a research log. Uh, I have them. I have one for every person that I'm working on. There we go. So 
So I prefer to work in Excel. This is just what I do. So this is an example. I'm going to go up to the one that we're going to look at in a minute, all the way up here. Uh, so here was an example. I wanted to prove the birth date of John Ralph Austin. So in October of 2016, I have the name of the record. I have the repository, the record type. Look at what a good boy I am. I have a source citation. Okay. Then I come over here and I have a transcript extract. Some people are saying, well, you have the image. Why do you have to have all the text? I want the text. I write up the biographies and I write up stories about my family. Then over here, I'm actually analyzing the evidence. Oops, hold on. So it's a derivative document. How do I know? It was a scan document. It's clear. The information is primary. The card was filled out by my great grandfather personally with his signature and is a direct information. Do you know the difference between direct and indirect information? Direct information is this. I'm trying to prove his birth date. It says I was born on January 31st, 1896. But if you were to go to a census, very often it gives the age of a person on a specific date and you need to back engineer what their possible birth year was. That, that's called indirect evidence. Indirect is not as good as direct evidence. We always hope for direct evidence. But if you look at this, now I have it marked in green because I'm a color guy, as you can tell. But green means this is positive information. I have other entries in here that are red because it's negative. It doesn't prove the point or it's not conclusive. But see, I have all these birth records. Uh, and here's one. This one does not really prove it because it's a 1900 U.S. Census that only gives his age. Well, the 1900 was special. They gave the month and the year they were born. Only time the census ever did that. But still, it didn't give a specific day. So it doesn't satisfy my requirements. Now, I found 10 different documents to prove my great-grandfather's birth date. And I came to the conclusion that they all, for the most part, came up with the same date. So, I, you know, I did the job. Then, and only then, does my information go into my heritage, you know? So that, that's what I do, because this is my sandbox. This is my play area, and that's personally the way I do it. You can come up with any other combination of this if you want, but I will tell you that tracking your work is really a great way to go ahead and uh, understand how these documents work. So here's a case study. How are we on time, Daniel? Good, okay. So this is uh, basically, uh, you know, this is what I know so far. John Ralph Austin was in fact born in Lyleville, New York, January 31st, 1896. Had been told that his wife's name was Therese McGinnis. So working on the marriage date and location, uh, that's what I'm trying to prove. And I found a 1920 U.S. Census uh, that may or may not be in line with this information. So I have to go through. Now, could I do this in, in 15 minutes? Well, I could look at the document in 15 minutes. That would be great. And one of, what's one of the first things you should always do when you find a document? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are a lot of people that don't do that, and then they wonder, where is that document I worked on last night? And when I say save it, you can attach it to your tree if you want to. Uh, on my heritage. I'm a big proponent, though, of saving a local copy. Now, this is what happens, at least with that other company with the big A. Uh, this is why I brought up licensing on the Yad Vashem stuff. Uh, in the U.S., many of our data sets are, are licensed exclusively or, or for a set period of time. In Chicago, I live in Cook County, which I call Crook County, uh, and we used to be able to get birth and marriage and death records. What da ha ha Ah, you know where I'm going. So we used to be able to get them through Ancestry or Family Search. We use Family Search as a better example. Online, and life was good. You wake up one morning, and guess what? All you have is an index. No more images. Cook County decided, well, we're going to sell them for $15 each off of our website. So if you had not saved those images, you were out of luck. And this happens. It's not very common. But it is also we're finding on Family Search, if you know that sometimes you'll find something on Family Search, but it says you have to go to an, an affiliated library or a Family Search Center. 
because that's the licensing requirement that they did with Family Search. So that's why you should always, always uh, save this document. Well, let's see. Uh, yes, I did get the MyHeritage version of it. Thank you. Let's see if I can get logged in here. I don't know whose account I'm using on this, so okay. So this is the document I found. What's the first thing I notice? The name is different, Rolf, R-O-L-F. I think that is the way that it actually looks. That's the way the enumerator wrote it down, and this is how it got indexed. Now, I, I'm not a big fan of indexing on some companies. Uh, I need to tell you the funniest story I found on Ancestry is I was this woman was working on 1870 Texas on a family that had a very English surname, and there was a baby Mohammed listed. First name baby, second name Mohammed. How many baby Mohammeds do you think there would be in Eastern Texas in 1870? Well, you pull up the record and the enumerator wrote baby name not mentioned. And it actually did look like Mohammed, I have to say it did. So those things sneak in there. So yeah, 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 yeah. So, but this, this is what we have here is I can go ahead and I can view the, view the screen, view the document here. I'm gonna view it full screen. There we go. Uh, and it pulls out all of this information here. It also pulls out some information that I don't know. It has the head of household is a Bridget Milligan. I don't know who this woman is. This is the first time I've ever encountered this name. So what do I do? It goes on my to-do list, right? I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole right now. Uh, it could be, but actually my... You know what I found? And now, you're right, because you're looking at rumor for all these other people, right? What I found is usually you wouldn't let strangers stay in your home. We're not in the age of Airbnb here, okay? Usually there was some connection. You want to know the truth. I'll show also there's an Owen Milligan, and he's age 70. So it looks like Bridget and Owen are married. I will tell you that actually is my second great-grandmother. And she was the head of the household because she was a real ball of buster. She really was. I mean, she just, she just, she did. She just, you know, she ran a grocery store and I can see her doing that. But why in the heck would she list her husband, her second husband as a rumor? Why would she list her son-in-law, her son-in-law, Ralph Austin, as a rumor, her own daughter, Therese Austin, as a rumor, and then her grandson, Alfred Austin, as a rumor, and... Loretta McGinnis is her other daughter. So I don't know how that happened because if we look at the actual document here, you will see that it actually, let me see if I can do this. Yeah, no, not that. The thing is, we do know looking at someone else below that the enumerator knows how to write the word wife and daughter and son. This was just something that was just really bizarre. Uh, so don't always assume that a rumor or a border is not a relative. Sometimes in a census, they were only allowed to show certain relationships. So if it, there's no such thing as a cousin-in-law for census enumeration. But still, that's that whole fan club concept, friends, associates, and neighbors. What I'm trying to get at on the genealogy pit stop here is this is, becomes a very interesting situation. It took me a while to untangle it. But I was here to prove Ralph Austin's birthday, right? I'm going to put this project aside. I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to put it on the to-do list and do that. The other thing I do want to show you on my research log, two things. Down below here, you can't see the tab very well, but I have built in, and this is all in the one that you download for free. It's copyright free. You can use it. Uh, I have a to-do list for every person that I'm researching. So here's yellow. These are the ones I'm working on now. Yellow is pending. Green is done. Uh, and these are things that I'm working on now. And so I, I don't do my research uh, to-do list on a separate document. I actually do it in this document. And here, I can add things. Here's one I added recently. I found out from the World War I draft card that he worked at a company called Fireproof Products Company Incorporated in Manhattan. Now, knowing me, you know what I would do? I'd look it up on Google, find the address, go to Google Maps, and see what it looks like on Street View. See? 
that's the big time suck that you get into. Uh, but actually, I put it there, and I added it to the to-do list and got to it eventually. The other thing is, if you're worried about source citations, look at down here. I have the 50 most popular U.S. source citation templates that you can just copy and paste and fill in the blanks. Time saver, right? And then the other one over here, evidence evaluation. If you wanted to know the difference between an original source and a derivative source, direct evidence and indirect evidence, I have it all laid out here because sometimes even I can't remember what all the iterations are. So my idea for a pit stop is have the tools available and also make sure that you have everything that you need at one touch. Uh, these are out of order, but uh, so how would I break down the new information into proof points? Well, I've got like a Bridget Mulligan. So I'm going to say, who is Bridget Mulligan? Uh, how is she related to Ralph Austin? Who is Owen Mulligan? Uh, and how would I enter that in the to-do list? This is what you need to do when you find these things that pop up. Uh, also, what else should be done with this record on the site? I mean, you should save it. You should give it an appropriate name so you can find it later. Uh, you also do want to make sure it's backed up as well. Backups are very important. Now also, uh, so this is what you do. It is your research, your method, and your system, okay? Don't let anyone say, well, you've got to do it this way. The research log that I came up with does not work for everyone. Uh, so some people say may say it's make work. You have to understand, I've done professional client research where I've had to actually prove court cases, and I had to have everything documented and dotted that way. Uh, remember, this Family Search Wiki is your best way to get smart quickly. This is your best research focused on genealogy. Don't panic and don't get sloppy. I had to add an, uh, this is the way I get sometimes when things are sloppy and I'm like panicking here. And also, this is one thing that I've came up, come up with. That 1920 census had a few things that were different from other censuses. So I came up with my own cheat sheet. And I said, you know, look for this, look for that. Uh, do you want to know another one for 1940? If you've ever seen someone and next to their name is a circle with an X, do you know what that means? The informant. They were the one that t spoke to the enumerator. The only census where it's listed. So that's one of those little aberrations that I want on a cheat sheet because I'm not going to be able to remember that. Okay? So, great. Uh also, I have added in the handout, so we're not going to have time to go over it. But again, I have given you a document uh, on my great-grandfather, and this is his World War I draft card. And just to show you things that are new to me, uh, over here I said that it was the, the, uh, he worked for a uh, salesman for Fireproof Products uh, Company Incorporated. Also, look at up here, 3157 Broadway. So I know where he lived on June 5th, 1917. Uh, yeah, June 5th. So I might want to go and look at that. You want to know what my secret is? I go and look at addresses, and sometimes I hit a real estate listing where the house is for sale, and I can go in and see my ancestor's home. So that's what I use. I use Trulia and all of these real estate sites to research my ancestral addresses. Uh, so, you know, these are the things. This is the methodology. You want to prove his birth, and that's what your goal is, but you're going to get all these other new clues. You want to break it down into proof points, and you also want to think about entering that information in the to-do list now. If you don't do it now, you're going to forget about it, and if you follow it now, you go down the rabbit hole. So, Okay, questions. That is my email address. Do not be a shy person. You can always email me. I will also put my business card up here for the folks that are here in Israel. Question. I do, yes, exactly. For, for Bridget Mulligan, I mean, she just ages wonderfully through the census. I mean, just it just changes all the time, you know? So that's one thing that you're right. It really does. And uh, exactly until you have, the thing is, I did find it on her death certificate. And now you can't be sure why, because who was the informant? And also it becomes secondary information. It becomes secondary, not primary. 
Uh, it's probably so that how many times have you seen a birth, death certificate where the son didn't know his mother's maiden name? I've only seen one great death certificate. It was filled out by the decedent. She was a genealogist. She was in hospice care and had no living relatives. And I'm sure she said, damn it, this is going to be right. So they had her as the informant on her own death certificate. So, yeah, but that's a great question. Yes. Right. Right. They may have passed away or they may have. They, yes, I'm sorry. Let me repeat the question. Yeah. So working with UK censuses, as you go through the years, you might find that family members disappear. So it could be uh, that they passed away. Uh, yeah. Uh, especially at a young age, or they could have married, they could have moved. Uh, in my case, with my Dutch ancestors in New York, they tended to recycle the name Johannes. I have one family where they had six boys die in infancy, and they're all named Johannes, you know, to do that. So, but that's the sort of thing that you have to look for as well. That, that's a good question. Other question, I think, yes, right here. Yes. Yes, hundreds, yes. Yes. Well, you know, the, the, so the, the, this is the question. Let's say you have hundreds of relatives that you're working on, and, and I do. I mean, my tree has over 7,000 on, on, on my heritage. And the thing is, how do you, you know, figure that out? Uh, well, I make sure that all my to-do lists are labeled as a file correctly, and I'm only usually working on one person at a time. But there are times when I'm thinking, okay, make sure, because you have, Two people will share record sets like marriage records, right? So I want to make sure, okay, for John Ralph Austin, his marriage date and marriage location, then I need to open up the to-do list for Therese McGinnis, his wife, and do the same thing. Yes, you know, it is. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that it's, it's, it's busy work. I don't see it that way. It's, for me, it's keeping organized. I'm also OCD. I think most genealogists are anyway, but it can be. Uh, but the thing is, you know, I have binders for every surname, and I'm also passing on a legacy to my family. So it's already in my will and te last will and testament what's to be done with my research, because my family, they will burn it on the front lawn if they had their own way. They would. They would. And uh, but the thing is, so the thing is, I mean, why are we doing this? I mean, we're not just having fun. We're, we're spending money. But we're also building a legacy for our future generations. And that's why I, I do all this work the way that I do it. So other questions? Well, thank you so much. I hope this is helpful. I'll be back for another show, right? Yes. OK. Uh, later on. Thank yes, you yes, 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 yes. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. It's uh, really a pleasure always to hear thank you me. and to learn from you. And as I reading, on the feedbacks of the people on the webinar, they are also learning a lot. Great. Uh, so again, thank you all very much uh, for being here with us uh, today. And now we are going to change uh, to the next uh, presentation. So hope uh, you enjoyed and see you soon.